going to, we're going to uh, get into the sermon, and one of the things that, um, that I feel like is a, one of those culture-defining moments, one of those culture-defining things, is this idea of offense. Who knows what offense is? Who knows what it means to be offended? Um, and this idea that we've got cancel culture, we've got woke culture, you've got uh, people who are mad that there is a cancel culture and woke culture, you've got, you've got every, and everything in between. And I don't know about you guys, but living in an offended state all the time is not a place I want to be. Uh, and frankly, I don't have the energy for it. Um, you may have noticed I have a few children. I've got five of them. I don't have the energy to be offended, all right? Um, and so one of the things that I've learned is offense does not, does not produce anything most of the time, especially when it's an offense of pride, when it's offense a personal offense, or an offense that um, we take personally. It reminds me of a, uh, a story I heard one time of two ranchers uh, named Joe and Lou. Now, Joe and Lou were uh, um, neighbors. And now some of you have been on farms, you've been on ranches, you know how this works, that everybody, you take turns fixing fence, okay? It's just kind of how it goes. You, you know, you share a border, you kind of sh- you have to share the, the responsibility as well of that fence. Um, at least that's in theory how it's supposed to work. <laughs> it doesn't always work out that way. Well, one day, um, Joe goes out um, and sees there's, there's a hole, kind of a hole starting to develop in the fence. It's not a, a full hole yet. It's just a loose part of the fence that needs to be tightened up and fixed. And, um, and it was Joe's, it was Lou's turn to fix. Um, turn me down just a hair, would you? Um, it was Joe's turn to fix, or excuse me, Lou's turn to fix the uh, fence. Well, of course, an argument ensued where Lou said, no, no, it's your turn. Back and forth they went. And sometime later, um, some yearlings were in the pasture right next to where the fence was broken. And so, of course, you can see what happened. The storm comes. uh, Yearlings are notorious for being jumpy. And they get out. And they get out of the pasture where this fence is compromised. And sure enough, what happens to those cattle is they run right through this fence. Now, in this moment, did this argument, did this offense, what did it create? More problems. And that's the point. Eye for an eye works great in theory, but when you actually begin to break it down, when you actually see what does offense produce, now, there's a difference between offense and righteous indignation, okay? Righteous indignation is the, is the concept of understanding that it's not about me. In fact, it may have nothing to do with me. It may be an injustice for someone else. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the Facebook memes. I'm talking about the, I'm talking about the uh, endless assault of media that we experience in our culture that says that I should be outraged by X. And it doesn't matter if you watch Fox News, CNN, MSNBC, you're going to be hit by it. And at a certain point, I have to ask the question, what would Christ's response be to all of this? So we're starting Matthew chapter 5 and verse 38. So if you would turn with me there, turn in your iPhones if you would, it's a joke, or iPads as some people might have. Not pointing fingers, Josh. Um, so <laughs> I'm teasing him. Um, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 38, it says this. You have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you, to take your tunic. Let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to the one who begs from you, and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. Now, that may seem extreme in our 
Western thinking, okay? But there's a couple of things there we need to break out. First of all, um, an eye for an eye and tooth for tooth was a saying from the Old Testament, okay? And it was, this, it was essentially saying, whatever you do to me, I'm going to do to you, right? Now, the problem with this is kind of like the, the Lou and Joe story that I told, is it tends to spiral out of control until what was a minor situation turns into a bigger one. And this is kind of what Christ is getting at here, is that he's not saying don't resist evil at all, and he's certainly not advocating abuse, you know. You shouldn't, go around, you shouldn't, you shouldn't you know, necessarily let people go around slapping each other, okay? But what he's, what he's advocating is this idea of personal pride. This, not that we shouldn't have pride in ourselves or our appearance in, in, the, in that sense, or, but he's talking about when somebody does something to you, it's a choice. You have a choice in that moment. You have a choice whether to be offended or to say, you know what, it's in God's hands. Now, if somebody comes picking on my son or my wife or one of you guys, that's a different story. Okay? But that's not what he's talking about here. See, this, this, argument, this passage has been used for uh, pacifism. That's not what he's talking about here. He's not talking about pacifism. If you've ever read Paul's letters, you know pacifism was not his strong suit. Okay? But what, he was, what, we're, what he's getting at here is this pride of personal offense. It's this idea that I have a right to be outraged. And in America, you do. You have a right to free speech. You have a right uh, to express yourself. But in the sense of what, it, what is the Christ-like response, let it go. And don't start singing the song, okay? Because then it'll be in my head all day, so please don't do that. No, um, but yeah, it's to let it go, because offense is a choice. Offense is a choice. It's a mindset that we get, in, we get into. It's a mindset. The best thing I can ever do at, at, in most days is after, after the news goes through the basic happenings of the day is to turn it off. Why? Because at the end of the day, they're telling me what I need to be offended about or what I need to be outraged for. It's good to keep up on current events, but it's not okay to take offense or take up other people's offenses. This doesn't mean there isn't righteous causes. It's not what I'm talking about either. But this is the idea that we write people off based upon their political views or their or, 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 or what they, are, they choose to be outri outraged in that moment. And I'm just old enough to remember what it was like to sit down across from somebody and have a cup of coffee with somebody I disagreed with. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. And to have a conversation and know to avoid that topic. That was considered a courtesy at one time. You know, there was the old, old wise tale, never talk religion or politics, right? Unless you really knew somebody. Sometimes, sometimes that old wisdom was wiser than we ever thought possible. I think this is a choice. Matthew 18, 21 through 23 says it this way. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? And Jesus told him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. That's 70 times seven. That's 490 times. Now, here's the thing. If you're forgiving someone and you're keeping track of how many times you've forgiven them, have you really forgiven them? That was, that's kind of, Jesus was being a little tongue-in-cheek there. If you're counting 
how many times you forgive them, then it's really not forgiveness. If you're counting how many times they've personally slighted you, then it's really not forgiveness. Now, please hear me. It's not what we shouldn't protect ourselves. There are people who are untrustworthy, and if we know they're untrustworthy, it's okay to say, you're going to be limited how much you get to be in my life. That's okay. That's not what we're talking about either. But we're talking about this, again, a mindset of offense. A mindset that says, I get to write you off because of what you think, say, or believe. I get to write you off because I disagree with you. I get to think of you less than human because of what you think, say, or believe. That is a judgment that is not, that is not godly, nor is it Christ-like. Because even a God of justice, which we believe in, we believe that God will judge everyone eventually, but even even a God of justice still sees that person as valuable and as a human being. And don't get me wrong, when you're tired and you're exhausted, it can be hard to give grace. I've been there. I can remember, I remember a situation for a while, I had to stop checking emails on Sunday morning. There was an individual in the church who would bring up things that sometimes were nine months removed from the original situation. But they always emailed me on Sunday morning. (laughs) And in that moment, I had a choice. I could choose to be angry and offended and try to get up into the pulpit and preach. Or I could choose to let it go and deal with it later. Or better yet, just not check my email, which was eventually the place that I got to. And to this day, I don't check messages most of the time on Sunday morning, unless I know I'm getting something specific from somebody. And what it came down to was they were making a choice to be offended, and I had to make a choice not to be. That's not to say that I always have made that choice, okay? (laughs) Please, I'm not trying to set myself up as a saint here. But just to help you understand that there are situations where I, you know, I, I could have chosen to be offended. This is a hard one. You're not going to get a lot of amens out of this one. Because let's be honest, as human beings, we like drama. We do. But drama is not necessarily what's best for us. keep moving. Chapter 5, verse 43, it says, Matthew chapter 5, verse 43, you have heard it that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of the father who is in heaven. For he makes his, he makes his son rise on evil and on the good, and it sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do even the Gentiles do the same? You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. That's a challenge. If you just, if you just greet people warmingly and lovingly that with you, that's a problem. That's a problem. Because Christ greeted even those not only he disagreed with, but adamantly disagreed with their lifestyle. A great example of this is the woman at the well. This was a woman that we know had five husbands. That was very unusual in that day. Okay? For men, male, male or female, okay? That was incredibly unusual, especially in the Near East. In Rome, maybe there was, somebody might have one or two or three spouses in a lifetime. 
But this was incredibly unusual in Samaritan times. They had a, a, some pretty strict deals there. So for Jesus to even be talking to a Samaritan woman was a big deal, but even a one that was, would have been considered of ill repute would have been even more so. That's why she was going to the well at, in the middle of the day, see, by herself. So it's important for us to understand that Christ was no respecter of persons. It didn't matter what people did. Now, he was very clear. Go and sin no more was something he commonly said. But that didn't mean he didn't show love to them. He didn't show care to them. I love this passage because it tells us it rains on the just and the unjust that God is equally fair in the distributing of blessing and those things that we don't consider blessings so much. Those hard times and those good times, they get distributed pretty equally, whether you're rich or poor, whether you're old or young, good or bad, there's those, those, those things that come, those challenges of life are equally distributed. Not necessarily by God, but just by the fact that life is hard. And that is what should somewhat unite us, I think. Is that we need somebody to care for each and every one of us that I do give a hoot about what happens to you, even if I don't like you, even if I disagree with you, even if we're never going to go hang out and have coffee, that I could still, if you come to me and say, I need this, that I can go, you know what, I love you enough to say yes. Now, we're not in the enabling. That's not what I'm talking about either. But this is about genuine need. This is about genuine love and genuine compassion. That is what it's about. John 1, chapter 4, verse 18 says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must love his brother. Freedom comes from forgiveness. We have to understand. We have to understand that our love is not optional. That if we want to be Christ-like, love is not optional. And, and, and you may say, well, who's our brother? Who's sitting next to you? Who's your sister? Who's sitting next to you? There's something powerful about that. And I'm not saying we don't speak truth. You know, we should, we should have an opinion. That's okay. But understand that at a certain point, an opinion can become something that drives a wedge. So I, I see this all the time. Is you see it a lot in, in our world today. If somebody expresses an opinion... And then it becomes an offense. And then somebody unfriends you from Facebook or somebody, you know, sends you a nasty note, writes a nasty comment. And none of it in love. Social media is one of those interesting things because right now, I mean, everybody from, you know, 13 to, you know, 83 has some form of social media anymore. I mean, that's, that's literally the age ranges are quite large. Not that everybody has a social media account, 
But here's an interesting thing is it seems like that once people get on social media and they get behind a keyboard or behind their screen of their phone, they become this social media warrior. The hardest thing to do sometimes is, is the, the courage not to comment, even if you think you're right. Because here's what I ask myself is, is this worth it? Is this worth the irritation, the anger, the frustration that's going to come when I comment on this and I know what they're going to say back? Sometimes simply saying, you know, nothing at all is the best way to go. This doesn't mean we can't have spirited debate, but that we got to know when enough's enough when we start to cross lines. Acts 16, there's the, is the story of um, the Philippian jailer. This is when Paul is arrested and is about to be tried and is going through that process. Um, and um, we, know, we, we believe there was probably some beatings involved. Uh, definitely they were in jail. And it's interesting to me, even though Paul had protested, hey, I'm a Roman citizen, this is wrong, I have rights, sound familiar? <laughs> they threw him in jail anyway. And I, I find it interesting what his response was. It wasn't to yell and scream and, or to get red-faced or to rail against it was to praise God in the middle of a jail, in the middle of the most, I mean, one of the worst things that I could think could have happened in those days, or even today, to lose your freedom, to lose your rights. And yet, hey, what was his response? To sing. And God does this amazing thing that an earthquake comes and literally the doors are shook off the place. Yeah, they know how they did hinges back then. They weren't closed hinges like we have today, okay? They would actually, they were pretty easy. You just lift up on the door. They were heavy, but you could lift up on the door and just take them off the hinges a lot of times. Well, so with all the shaking, all the doors fell off. And what was crazy is this guy comes in, the, the warden comes in and thinks all the prisoners have escaped. Now, if you had that happen in your, in, your, uh, in your prison, if you were a warden, the natural consequence was death. So he was going to kill himself. Paul yells out, no, 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 we're all still here. You don't have to do that. He leads, he leads the man who was taking away his freedom, by the way, who was the instrument of his affliction, and he leads him to Christ. Now, if Paul had taken offense and become bitter and become angry, what would have happened? Nothing. He would have ran away, and he would have been like, serves you right. I hear that out of a lot of our Christians these days. A arrogance that says serves you right when something goes wrong or something goes bad for a, to a group of people we happen to disagree with and i'm not saying i agree with all, all the groups of people that we have disagreements with okay i'm not saying that they're right but what i am saying i want you to hear this what i am saying is i'm not going to win anything i'm certainly not going to win their soul By getting angry and offended. And I'm certainly not going to win their soul by driving a wedge between them and me. Now they may write me off, fair enough. But I'm not, I'm not going to be unchristlike. I'm going to try to follow Paul's example here. I'm going to try to take, take that step, if you will. And Maybe through my kindness and love, they'll realize the 
truth that is Jesus Christ. It's easy to be offended. It's much harder, much, much harder to choose life. Because by the way, offense kills you. Anger kills you. I've met people who have held on to anger and bitterness times four years and I'll tell you they're some of the most unhappy people because it's easy to choose that road but it's hard to leave it I want to say that again it's easy to choose that road but it is so hard to leave it because it, it involves a change of thinking and a change of heart that oftentimes we can't do ourselves we have to rely on Christ to change our heart for us We may have choose to follow Christ, but we have to choose also to be like him. And the only way we can do that is to trust the Holy Spirit can come inside of us and change our hearts. To have faith that he is going to change the desires of my heart. That was one of the things the speaker at camp talked about. He talked about quite a bit, in fact. that our experience with God should create movement in our heart. And this morning, my, my challenge to you is this. Is there something that you need to let go this morning? Maybe it's unforgiveness. Maybe it's past hurts. We've all had past hurts. We've all had family issues. We've all had problems with people at work. Some of you may have even endured abuse. And that person who's abused you, can I just tell you, still has power over your life when you don't forgive. You have to be willing to walk away because if you don't, you'll be bound in bondage for the rest of your life. You'll always be limited with the, the kind of freedom that you can have in Christ. Unforgiveness and the, and the desire to retaliate in this day and age can be so subtle and yet not subtle at all. It just depends on the situation. It can be that guy at work who argues about everything. You ever know that guy? You know who I'm talking about? Maybe you are that guy. I don't know. <laughs> it can be the neighbor who obnoxiously is up at all hours right? It's like, who mows their yard at 6.30 in the morning? I just want to know who does that. Shame on you. No, I'm just kidding. Some of us want to sleep, okay? I'm teasing. If you mow your yard at 6.30 in the morning, I'm not mad at you. All right, moving on. Maybe it's an ex or a friend on Facebook who comments at everything or takes jabs at you. Maybe it's the boss who always seems to be out to get you. It's the guy who backstabs you at work. Maybe it's the guy who gives you guff over politics. There are so many ways to be hurt. Maybe it's the family member who verbally abused you as a child. I can tell you, or even worse, I can tell you that there are, that hurt is not something that any of us have a monopoly on. There's not, not, there's none of us that get through this life unscathed. There are none of us that get through this life without some kind of pain. But see, we serve a healing God, a God of forgiveness, a God of grace. But not just, not just grace for us, but grace for others as well. And by letting go of that hurt and that unforgiveness, we open up ourselves to the fullness of our relationship with God.
And the reality of it is, is when you're hurt in this world and somebody hurts you especially, I can tell you there's only one response that I have found that always brings the freedom and the grace that I need to get through a day. And that's forgiveness. That's choosing not to be offended. That's choosing not to be a person who lives in bitterness. And I'll tell you, I've been, I've been doing this a while, and I'll tell you, I, I have a reason several times a week to be offended. And if I took every opportunity to be offended, I would be a much more angry pastor. <laughs> but I choose not to. And that doesn't make me better. It just, and it doesn't mean that I always get it right. Because I don't. There was a situation a while back that took me a year or two to finally get over. Sometimes forgiveness is a daily choice, especially when it's a, it's a deep hurt or it's a, it's, a, it's a personal hurt between family members or a personal hurt between you and someone else. It's a daily choice to forgive. It's a daily choice to say, God, I'm so angry today. I don't understand how to let this go. I need your grace. I need you to do a work in my heart this today, and I need to let it go for today. And then you wake up the next day, and you say, God, I need help today to let it go. And eventually it gets easier and easier until you forgive. For some of you, it may be your kid that has walked away from the Lord or has personally slighted you or personally hurt you. Can I tell you, you will earn more respect from them from forgiveness than you will ever from bitterness or anger or by standing your ground. And I don't mean standing your ground by saying that what they did was right, by standing your ground and saying, I'm not going to talk to you or I'm not going to interact with you just because I disagree with you. Mark eleven twenty four says it this way. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. And whenever you, are sta- whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you your trespass. We have to ask God's help. But forgiveness uh, for a Christian is not necessarily optional. It's something that we have to choose every day. We have to ask for God's help every day. Forgiveness is a choice. Offense is a choice. Can I encourage you this morning to choose freedom over bondage? To choose life over death? Choose forgiveness over bitterness. This isn't something I can make happen for you. I'll pray for you if that's what you want. But if you want to come up and I'll anoint you with oil, I can do all that. But ultimately right now, it's going to be between you and God in that seat. What is it that you're having trouble letting go of? What is it? that causes you to live in anger, to live in bitterness and frustration. God does not want that of you. He did not die on a cross 2,000 years ago and bleed for that. And I know I've been serious for a while now. And I'm good at, at, at keeping things light and fun, but this is not light or fun. God is calling you to something better and greater. Every head bowed and every eye closed, Josh is going to come and just begin to pray. I want you to connect with God this morning. This isn't one where we necessarily need to flood the altar. This is one where you need to flood heaven with your prayers. This is one where you need to ask 
Lord, how do I live and walk in forgiveness and peace? How do I walk in love and grace? It's easy to say, it's harder to execute. But God, God does it for us every day. He applies the blood of Jesus to our sins. As Josh begins to play, the altars will be open. If you have any special prayer for anything, but this morning, let's just take a time to ask God to cleanse us of unforgiveness. And I'll close in a word of prayer when we're done. take this sermon to heart. We take this message from the Gospels, from the Apostles, from the people who first lived out this message. And when we realize that we walk in freedom when we walk in grace, that we walk in freedom when we walk into for, in forgiveness, God, we worship you, we thank you, and we give you all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. Thank you guys for coming. You are dismissed. If you need anything, please don't hesitate to pull me aside, okay? Thanks. Be blessed.